All right, gentlemen, let's go. I remember now. Yes. If Good. the brother says to the employer, hey, you're addressing my sister, and the employer is Jewish, why aren't you putting the Jewish person in the hand of the boy? There are certain times, that's a good question, there are certain times where you're allowed to, it's an excellent question, there are certain times where you're allowed to do that, and certain times where you have to check with halachic authorities for, uh, for you know, before doing such a thing, but uh, that's a good, it's an important point. All right, gentlemen, we're on page 876. Shem speaks to Moshe, and he says to make the following announcement. Lamor means to Lamor means to make it a public announcement. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Akoin Heshivas Chamasi Mal ben Israel. Pinchas turned back my wrath from the Jewish people. Bekanoes kinosi besocham when he took my uh, vengeance among them. And I did not destroy the B'nai Israel in my anger. I mean, Pinchas essentially saved the entire Jewish people here. Uh, what we learned yesterday about Pinchas when he saw the two people engaged in uh, an act of immorality, and he goes and he spears them. So he's essentially saved the entire Jewish people. Now, if you take a look at Rashi, Rashi says that they were laughing at him. The other tribes were laughing at him. He says, here's a guy whose ancestor fattened Calves for idol worship. Second line of Rashi. Ben Puti Zeshe Pite Mavi Mogagolim Lavoros Kochavim. His ancestor, Yisro, who worshipped every idol worship in the world before finding God. Yisro was an expert in all the various isms. And then he found God. Viharag Nasi Shevet Me Yisrael. And he killed him. Pinchas comes from a, a, a grandfather who was an idol worshiper, and he goes and he kills a prince in Israel. Therefore, the Pasa goes and says, yeah, well, his, also his ancestry came from Aaron Akoin. So Pinchas, his, his ancestor is Yisrael, but his ancestor is Aaron. Now, what, 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 there are several points here in this Pasa. First of all, you'll notice that there's a small yud in the word Pinchas, and often the word Pinchas is written without a yud at all. Pinchas says, in generally, most people whose name is Pinchas, they spell their name without a yud. The yud is an optional letter. It's like a GH in English, right? It's like light or light, you know, or, you know, or, you know, through or through. You get THRU or THROU, which are, we, most of those words anyway come from a German pronunciation of a ch, the, the, the licht in German, German, light, light in, in German or Yiddish is licht. So that's why I came light in English. Why do you keep the H and GH? What's the GH doing over there? A couple of, a couple of uh, you know, redundant letters. It, it's generally a, 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 a carryover from a different language. Here, uh, 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 there's a Yud written in Pinchas' name. Now, there are different opinions what that Yud is doing there. There's one of the Yud numerical value of Yud in, in, uh, in Hebrew is a 10. And the Medrash says there were either six, there are different versions in the Medrash. Six miracles were done for Pinchas when he went and killed Zimri. Remember yesterday, we remember the miracles that were done for him? That, 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 that Zimri didn't stop what he was doing, he didn't turn around and kill Pinchas, and that the, the doorpost went, and they didn't slip off the spear, all these various miracles. There's another opinion that there were 10 miracles that were done, and therefore the Yud alludes to those 10 miracles. That's one of the opinions. What is interesting is if you add the numerical value of Pinchas, mayor, you get how much? What, 208? 208. Yeah, he, he's got this annoying habit of being able to do that really fast. Yeah, yeah. So Pinchas, Pinchas with, uh, with, uh, with what do you call it? Pinchas, if you add it up, the numerical value, I'll show you how it works. 80, yeah, pay is 80, and a yud is 10. Top line, pay is 80, yud is 10 is 90, and a nun is 50. So we're up to 140. I'm a demon. Uh, ches is 8. <laughs> So we're up to 148, and a Samach is 60, so it comes out to 208. Now, I was curious about that myself, and I noticed that 208 Pinchas, who, who basically risks his life over here to do this, is the same numerical value with the Yud as Yitzchak. How do you like that? Yitzchak is 208. And, and, and I thought to myself that it could be that the Torah is alluding to the idea that the same way that Yitzchak's life was risked, you know, when a father puts his son on an altar and is ready to slaughter him, that's a pretty big risk. Till the angel comes back, don't try it. Kids at home, don't try this. <laughs> you know, you, know, you, got, you got to rely on an angel to tell you not to slaughter your son. So, so Yitzchak, Yitzchak was in a very dangerous situation. 
Pinchas also risks his life. And then Shabbos accidentally, this last Shabbos, and it's totally accidental, don't ask me, it is, uh, I happen to be looking at the Zohar, that does not happen, uh, just because I was curious more, I was just looking through, I'm not, I'm not a Zohar guy, I'm telling you right now, I don't, I've, I've almost never looked at the Zohar ever, and I happen to look at it, and the Zohar says that Pinchas was fortified with the Gvura, the strength of Yitzchak, that's what the, that's what the Zohar says. Right, so I was very happy to see that that, that what he called. But that's the only thing I understood in the Zohar. After looking through everything else, I didn't understand a word they were talking about. But the uh, the uh, I don't even know why. I know I was looking at because somebody said there's a new Zohar with a certain commentary. I just wanted to get an idea, and I'm you know just kind of leafing through, and all of a sudden I said Pimchas and Yitzchak on the same page. In any event, he is uh, uh, what he called it after. Maybe there's a uh, Chumash. Maybe there's like a Chumash for the young man who just walked in here. Page two, page uh, eight. <laughs> I'm sorry, eight seventy six. So uh, I'm just a little hoarse because I'm taking this anti, uh, this uh, allergy medication. So uh, I've been getting these allergic, the allergic guy. Apparently the doctor is not sure what, what it's coming from. It seems that it's work, that I'm allergic to work, right? So that's the, uh, which I've known, for, I've known that for a long time. <laughs> But uh, but uh, whatever it is, uh, so so I, it's it's just the medication gets me a little loopy here. It gets a little, little it, it dries me up. So uh, but no, you guys don't care. So uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, you know we're Jewish. We got to talk about our ailments. You know, oh yeah, you know I got this. <laughs> so so um, Pinchas is first of all he is traced to Aaron Akoid. What well, again? Whenever you get to Aaron, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Peace. Peace. Aaron is the is the is 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 the Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. He's the man who loves peace and he pursued peace and he was the influence of peace in the Jewish people. So Pinchas, what's the connection to Pinchas and Aaron? The answer is that okay, at this point, according to most commentaries, Pinchas is not yet a Kohen. But as a grandson, you know that if you know every morning in Shul we do the Birkas Kohanim, the priestly blessing, a Kohen who has killed somebody, even unintentionally, is not allowed to do the priestly blessing if there's negligence, if there's any negligence in it, and certainly if it's intentional. A Kohen is not allowed to do the priestly blessing if he's killed somebody. Somebody who's caused a chas if a Kohen kills somebody in a traffic accident, so he wouldn't be allowed to do it, depending on how much of it was his fault, what degree it was his fault. Pinchas is a descendant of Aaron. I, you know, you got a family tradition over here. But, you know, Aaron is the candy man in Shul. You know, and he's got a grandson, you know, and, 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 now, and all of a sudden Pinchas, who comes from a family where there are no spears around the house, and there are no weapons around the house because the Kohanim didn't go to war, so he then picks up a spear and he commits the single most violent act we see every day described in the Torah. So the Torah is telling you, number one, the greatness of Pinchas is that this is something he had to do because he was spontaneously motivated to do such a thing. And it's not as if he had a family tradition. It's not like Aaron, you know, was, was, was a former MMA guy. You know, it, 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 he doesn't have a family tradition of violence, and he doesn't have a tradition, he, he has a family tradition of peace. But this had to be done, and therefore, Pinchas goes ahead and he does it, number one. Number two, it gives us an idea, you know, let's just read one more pasuk, for, and then we're going to come back to this, okay? Look at the next one. What is his reward? L'chenemor. Fourth line, therefore say, Moshe Ben, I want you to declare this. And the reason Moshe Ben is declaring it publicly is that anybody who might take vengeance on the behalf of, of, of Zimri, any of his family members who might contemplate taking revenge against Pinchas, they should hear this, that, this declaration that God is making. shalom. I give him my covenant of peace. That means Zimri, Pinchas was awarded the ancient world's equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize. Right? That's what happens. He's given a covenant of peace, which according to some means that is a guarantee from God that he's not going to be a victim of, of retribution from Zimri's relatives. According to some, that means that he's never going to die. Pinchas becomes, according to our tradition, Pinchas is... Elio Anovi, who never died human death as we understand it. Elio Anovi got into a chariot, went a flaming chariot, went into heaven. And not only that, in Nach, later on where Pinchas does appear, even though most leaders of the Jewish people, it mentions when they die, it never mentions Pinchas' death later on in Nach. And therefore, our tradition is that Pinchas eventually turns into Elio. Like the, what do you call it, the, uh, isn't it the, 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 what do you call it that turns into a butterfly? The, the, uh, 
the caterpillar turns into the butterfly, right? And, so, and he flies up into heaven. You know, so Pinchas is the, Pinchas is what he called, he becomes a Leonovi, and that's why he, traditionally Pinchas comes back to every bris. A Leo is called Malach bris. At every bris mila, every circumcision, we put out a chair. It's called Kisei Shel Eliyahu. And the, well, somebody is honored, somebody is given the honor of taking the baby and putting him down on the uh, chair of a Leonovi who comes to every bris. Why is that? Because Pinchas himself, stood up for the holiness of the bris by killing Zimri, who was violating it at this point. Therefore, his reward is that he's going to be at every bris, every bris of the Jewish people. Why are you smiling, Santi? You're wondering, wondering how he could be at two brises at once. You know, you know, there, there are, you know, and the, the, by Jewish people, they do quite a few brises every day. But then again, if you're Elia Novi, you got all sorts of, all sorts of rare abilities. Uh, by the way, just to give you an idea, you, you know where Kiryat Sefer is? Kiryat Sefer is in uh, Kiryat Sefer is right here between here and around around between here and Bnei Brak. It's a hundred percent from. It's a hundred percent religious. Uh, I mean, hardcore Haredi extremist stone throwing. You know that that you know really 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 from. You know the 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 most uh, 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 the, uh, probably the most highest percentage of absolutely Haredi in Kiryat Sefer. And in Kiryat Sefer, believe it or not, an entire class of children is born, I've heard two, an entire Cheder class is born either every day or every week. Yeah, so that's a lot of brisses. And Elia Novi has to be at all of them, you know. So, so you, you know, you're talking about, yeah, hardcore. So, so uh, um, and listen, it's from people, it's like they're, they're, they're a thousand, you know, you know, about probably 50,000 from families there. Right, so it's, a, well, by now it's 51,000. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the 52,000, so, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, quite, it's quite a big, uh, he, so Eliyahu Navi, somehow he's able to be at every risk. Now, he gets the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, and not because he turned them into pieces either, right? You know, that, that's not why. He, he gets the Peace Prize, it would be roughly the equivalent, and again, it's only my, my analogy, it's roughly the equivalent of in World War II when they bombed Hiroshima. Now, they bombed Hiroshima, I think even to this day the estimates keep going how many people were killed at Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. Right? August 6, 1945, they dropped the first atomic bomb and they dropped on Hiroshima. Now, would you say that the person who dropped the bomb, did he, did he, what, it, what, what, what did he accomplish? The answer is he probably saved more lives than he killed. Because had they not ended the war, who knows how many more people would have died? Because there was a war going on. There were a lot of people getting killed regularly. So that put an end, that, well, it didn't put an end, it, didn't, it took two lessons, right? Because on August 9th, on August 9th, uh, 1945, they had to drop another one on Nagasaki. Then they got the point. But at the end of the day, the person who dropped the bomb, what should he? What what award would you give it? Well, if you if you created peace, if you created peace, so so you get the peace prize. What he was happening? The Jewish people were dying over here. There's a plague. Pinchas puts an end to the plague by killing the criminal, killing a criminal, killing a, a an evildoer. The Gemara says that's as if you've you, you've offered a sacrifice. Brought a sacrifice. How do you like that? We're no pacifists in Torah, even though you would expect, you know, you'd think that there were just heads rolling in the streets of ancient Jerusalem based on the amount of time the Torah says, well, you die for this, you die for that, you die for the other. Yet the Gemara says that if a Bazdin killed somebody, executed somebody once in seven years, more than once in seven years, they're a bloodthirsty court. I admit the Torah talks all the time about, you know, well, you die for this, you die for that, but they, they, weren't, they, they, they weren't executing. But once in a while, somebody, you know, as they said in the Westerns, he needed dying, right? You know, so, so once in a while, somebody had to die, so they died him. You know, <laughs> you know, they died him red, you know, whatever it is. So, 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 so Pinchas deserves that he gets a peace prize from God. Okay, I told you, those of you who weren't here yesterday, those of you who weren't here yesterday, just, just to make it clear so nobody leaves here and goes out and purchases a spear, we're not allowed, we're not allowed to do this nowadays. There's no vigilanteism. There's no vigilante action, and you did nothing, any, anything that take care, take care, take a lot of action. Do you ever see Death Wish with Charles Bronson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good movie, right? That was one. Of, that was a long. That's an old, old movie. But that was that was a good movie. And he clobbered people. He took a, he took hosiery, and he stuffed it with with rolls of coins, like bank coins, and he put them in, and he clobbered muggers. 
right? And he put down, he cut down the cut, the crime rate dropped in New York because the buggers are worried that they're going to get killed. He was running around shooting people. It was a good, a really good movie. So he, uh, what do you call it? So, so that's vigilanteism. There is no vigilanteism in Torah. The only time there's vigilanteism in Torah is if you see somebody in imminent danger. If you see one guy chasing another guy, and he's looking to kill him, then you have an obligation to step in and kill the pursuer to save the life of the pursuit. And it doesn't matter how many people are pursuing him. It could be 10 people pursuing one person unjustifiably. I'm not talking about, talking about unjustifiably. Then you have to kill all 10 people, even though it means it would seem to be a bigger loss of life. Well, let them kill one guy, and you have 10 people. No, but they're wrong. Therefore, the obligation is to kill them. So Pinchas guesses. Now, if you want to see something fascinating, take a look at the second line. I've showed it, I showed this to you once before when we learned Parshas uh, uh, Kisisa, I believe. Take a look at the second line. Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Okoyin Heishi ves Chamasi. Look at the word Chamasi. Look at the word Chamasi very carefully. Do you see the two middle letters of the word Chamasi? Second line, fifth line, word out of the line. Chamasi. The two middle letters are Mace, death. Look at the two outside letters. There's a Ches on one side and a Yud on the other side, which stands for what? Chai. So what was happening among the Jewish people at this point? There was death. Death was closer. Life was farther apart because people were dying. What did he do? Hey, Shiv es Hamasi, he turned back my wrath. I mean, he turned death, he turned the word inside out. So that now there's life and the death is farther apart. That's what the Vilna Gaon says. Hey, Shiv es Hamasi, he turned back, he turned back my wrath. Now, the very interesting question here, okay? Stay with this. Is that a psh? That gets a psh. Okay, that gets a psh, guys. Let's hear it. One, two, three. There you go. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, now, if we're already, if we're already, so then let's go back for a second. <laughs> let's go back. All right, all right, take a look. I've showed you this once before, but we may as well. We're on a roll. Uh, take a look back at, keep your finger on the place here, but take a look back at the beginning of Parshas Kisiso. On page uh, 482, 484, 484. Um, okay, uh, page 484. Then this is talking about where the Jewish people have to give a coin. They have to turn in a coin. So if you look at the third line on the page, third line, three lines for the end of the line. Zayit nukola over alapikudim. This is what all those who are counted should give. Machatzis a shekel, the shekel, a half shekel coin. All right? Take a look at. Take. You have to see this inside. You have to see it inside. Page 484, 484, fourth line. The coin they're going to give. 484, fourth line. The coin they're going to give is a machatzis a shekel. Is there one more chumash here? Is there a chumash? Okay, give Blake a chumash. I want anybody to see it. Don't be shy, Blake. Blake, give Blake a chumash over there. Okay, look at the word machatzis. Now the middle letter, the little letter of the word machatzis on 484, fourth line, the little letter is a tzaddik. Tzaddik always stands for what? Tzedakah, right? Tzaddik stands for tzedakah. And we know there's a verse in Mishli that says, Sidaka tatzil mimavas. Tzedakah saves from death. A Jew who has any sort of threatening life situation gives tzedakah. When is the most common time we give tzedakah, gentlemen? When do we, everybody give tzedakah? Right before Yom Kippur. Good, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We give tzedakah. There's always the plates in the shul. Right? You, know, you walk in the shul and they got all these plates. That's not to help yourself, by the way. That's to put into the plate, not to, uh, right? So they have, the, they have the plates and you give, you're supposed to give tzedakah. Okay, the tzaddik stands for tzedakah and the verse says tzedakah tatzil mimavas. Giving tzedakah saves you from death. Why is that? There are two basic reasons. That means a person may have a death sentence hovering over him, and he can actually redeem himself by giving tzedakah. The more the merrier, by the way. But he can redeem himself. Why is that? Why does tzedakah save from death? The answer is twofold. Number one, in the old days, imagine a guy who's dying of starvation. He's literally on the verge of dying of starvation. This guy comes over to you, and he says, I'm dying of starvation. You give him 50 cents. And he takes the 50 cents and he goes to a store and he buys a piece of bread that keeps himself alive. And then the next day he gets a job and he makes money, starts earning money. Then eventually he gets himself back on his feet. Who, who saved him from life? Who saved his death? You saved his life. You gave him life. Literally gave him life. The guy would have starved to death. There were times in history people starved to death. Nowadays it's very rare. But it, 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 there were times and you kept the guy alive. So tzedakah, the same way you're, and how much did it take? 
For 50 cents, you kept the guy alive. You know how these stories end. Then he becomes a multi-billionaire and he looks for you, but he never finds you, right? So he, <laughs> the, the, right? So he becomes, so, so he's, a, he's a, what do you call it? He, 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 he gives a tzedakah. He gives a tzedakah. You gave him, you kept him alive. So Mita, God works. You get what? Mita connected, Mita quid pro quo. So you kept him alive. So tzedakah saves your life. Number one. Number two, where did he ever get money from? Where does anyone ever, well, most people, where do you get money from? The What's that? The Almighty. The Almighty gives it to us. Yeah, but how do you get it from the Almighty? Perfect. You work. You work. You, work. you, work. you know, unless you're, unless you're allergic. But you, <laughs> you, you, you work, right? Most people work. That's how, you, that's how you earn your money. When you work, what you're doing is you're giving up time. I'm using my time to make money. The only reason I'm doing this job, there are many jobs in the world, or the only reason I'm doing the job is because I need money. I'm loading boxes on a truck only because I need money, not the exercise. I once worked on a loading dock, right, a summer job, right? So I was doing it because I needed the, I wanted the money. So I'm giving up my time. Now, when you take that money and you give it to somebody else, essentially, what are you giving him? You're giving him your time. Well, your time is your life. You're giving a guy a chunk of your life. I gave up my life for that. I gave up a piece of my life for that money. So tzedakah, the merit of the tzedakah, the merit of tzedakah is that it saves from death. Now, take a look at this word machatzis, gentlemen. Look at the two letters closest to that, on the outside of that letter tzedakah. On page 8, 484, fifth line. 484, fifth line, the half shekel coin, machatzis. If you find it, please show the person next to you. The two letters surrounding the tzaddik, which stands for tzedakah, is a ches on one side and a yud on the other side, which is chai, which is life. And the two further letters on the outside are mem and atuf, which is mace. That means tzedakah brings life closer and it pushes death farther apart. And that's what Pinchas does over here. He turns back God's wrath. When God's wrath is unleashed, there's death in the world. So Pinchas turns back, Pinchas turns back God's wrath, and what do you call it? Okay. By the way, I heard once, now I, 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 I can't vouch for the truth. I, I, I was told it's a true story. There is a guy... Um, a kolol guy, somewhere in New York, Lakewood, New York, was, sorry, he was driving on the highway, and he noticed a limousine broken down at the side of the road. And the guy's fixing the tire. So this kolol guy gets out of his car, and he helps the guy fix the flat tire. Okay, and he gets, he drives off. You know. The next day, a truck pulls up in front of his house. The guy delivers a bouquet of flowers. There's a little envelope attached to it. There's a note inside. It says, thanks for the highway yesterday. I've taken the liberty of paying off your mortgage. Sincerely, Donald Trump. Right? Before he became president. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The, yeah. So, yeah. And, and what, is the, what is the Musser story? What is the lesson we're supposed to take out of the story? That if you ever see a car broken down on the highway, Drive past unless it's a limousine. Look for limousines, right? Because then it's likely. <laughs> if it's an old Chevy, forget about it. What are you going to get out of that except a slip disc? You know, forget about that. You know, no, they, they, you, you, you just never know in life. You just never know what that. That's what that's called. Stuck a tots will be mobus. Stuck it saves from death. I heard a story about a guy. By the way, there's a lady knocks on the door. I'll tell you two stories. A lady knocks on the door on a Thursday night, also by a Colo family. And some kind of, you look like kind of a deranged, uh, a dera some deranged lady, you know, not, not mentally, not, not mentally, fully mentally competent. And she knocks on the door and she says to this, this Kolo guy, she says, listen, I want a piece of chicken for Shabbos. It's th late Thursday night. I want a piece of chicken for Shabbos. So the guy says to her, listen, I got seven kids. We buy one chicken, we divide it up. Each one gets a little piece. There's some people live like that, by the way, in Kolo. Sometimes, you know, they're willing for the good of the cause. They live on a very, a very uh, tight, tight budget. So wait, I haven't got a spare piece of chicken. I'll give you something else. No, I want a piece of chicken. Ladies at the door, I want a piece of chicken. I want a piece of chicken. The guy says, all right, I'll go one job. I'll skip my, I'll skip my piece of chicken. I'll give her the stuck. I'll give her the chicken. So he opens up the refrigerator. His three-year-old son had gotten into the refrigerator and closed the refrigerator on himself. He was already turning blue. And the father will pulled out a piece of chicken and gave it to the woman, and they were able to save the kid's life. That's stuck a us. The difference between the kid dying and not dying was because he was doing the act of tzedakah. That's the and you find this all the time. There's another guy who had like a one-year-old baby, one and a half year old, and every night the baby, right, the, the baby would, would what do you call it? He would he would take a, a, a coin with the baby. And he would put it, there's a little stucca box there, a little, little charity box, and he would drop in a coin, and he would teach the kid how to say the word tzedakah, 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 that sort of thing. Okay, so one night, 
And every night he did this ritual, let the kid learn the word tzedakah. It's better than other words kids learn. So he, let, 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 her, let, her, let, let her learn that bad. Definitely, right? So he puts in this, this tzedakah. And then one night, you know, he's sitting in the house, he hears noise coming from the kid's room. And what happened was, when he had tucked, put the kid into bed, so he had some coins in his pocket, and the coins fell right into the crib. Now, a one-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old, the first thing they do with anything is they put it in their mouth. That's the first thing kids do. And the kid, instead of putting the coins in his mouth, was trying to reach for the tzedakah. He said, tzedakah, tzedakah, tzedakah. That was what I was trying to do. The father, because the father had trained the kid. That's tzedakah tatzil mimavis. By the way, the reason kids put things in their mouth, everything. Kids put everything in their mouth. You're missing your wallet? Check the one-year-old. He probably got it in his mouth. The reason they do that is for a kid, especially a baby who's a, who, 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 who is, to him, reality is what you put in your mouth. He doesn't know anything else. So that anything they find, they put in their mouth, right? That's a, that, that, that's the nature of kids, the uh, and drug addicts. But that's that, that's the uh, that, that's the what do you call it? That's the, uh, the okay. Now, um, so, so now, now now we're going to take it a little deeper over here. Okay, let's go a little let's let's go a little further with this. This guy Zimri. You know what? Let's read another pasuk. It's a covenant of kahuna forever which the commentaries say, all Kohanim Gedolim, subsequent Kohanim Gedolim, the high priests, they all came from descendants of Pinchas. That's one of the rewards he gets. Because he was zealous for the name of his God. And then, in Pasuk uh, uh, Yud Dalad, seven lines from the top, it says, V'shem ish Yisrael Hamuke, the name of the Jewish man who was smitten, Asher Huka Esha Midyonis, who was smitten with the Midianite woman, Zimri ben Salu, Nasi Beis of Lashimoni. Zimri ben Salu, the, uh, uh, the, the, the prince of the tribe of, of, of one of the families of Shimoni. Vishem Aisha Hamuka Hamidyonis, Kosbi Bastzur. The name of the Midianite woman was Kosbi, Rosh Umos Beis of Midyon, who was the head of the, uh, uh, one of the kings of Midyon. Now, there are several problems here. Problem number one is. If you look back, uh, when, when the action took place on the previous page, on page 874, you notice all it says is a man went and took the Midianite. In uh, Pasuk Vav, at nine lines from the bottom, sorry, eight lines. Vihine Ishmi Bnei Israel says a man from the Jewish people went and took this Midianite woman. Doesn't say his name and doesn't say her name. And then it tells us what Pinchas did. He killed them. Then it tells us the reward. And after all of that, all of a sudden, almost as an afterthought, it tells us what was his name. His name was Zimri, and her, he was Zimri, the head of a tribe, and her name was Cosby, the princess, a Midianite princess. Almost as an afterthought. I would have, I would have written it completely different. I would say, you know, there was a guy named. There's a guy named Zimri, and, and he took this, uh, he took this uh, what do you call this sorority girl named, named Cosby, and, uh, and what do you call it, the head of the sorority, and uh, uh, what do you call it, and, and that's, that's how I would have started the story. You know, and instead, it's almost as an afterthought. A, why is it, why is it an afterthought? Why is it putting down as an afterthought here? Anybody got an idea? Not to glorify what was done. What? To not glorify what was done. Oh, excellent, excellent. Meaning what? Meaning that we should focus on how it was dealt, how the problem was dealt with as opposed to the problem itself. So very close, very close. That means that means imagine your pinchas. It goes in two directions here. You know, sometimes there are people who are famous and there are people who are infamous. Right? People who are looking for fame but can't get it the right way. So what do you do? Go and shoot a celebrity. You know, go do something, go do something drastic. You know, and everybody, the whole world hears of you. Sometimes in life it's more fun if it's prominent people to get involved because if they're prominent people and I kill them, so then everybody's going to hear of me. You know, if these are just regular people on the street, you know, who cares? The regular people on the street, big deal. It could be anywhere in San Francisco. But here, you, here it's, what do you call You got very prominent people over here. So, yeah, wow, this is my chance for glory, number one. Number two, sometimes you may not want to get involved because when they're prominent people, you know, they got, they, they got an infrastructure. Who knows what's going to happen? What kind of revenge? You know, the mafia used to knock each other off. Then they'd have to, you have to go hiding. They got a whole, uh, 
you know, a whole, what do you call it over there? A whole bunch of guys who are waiting for his revenge and back and forth. So Pinchas has two possible motivations to either get involved or not get involved. He may have gotten involved because he wants the, 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 the acclaim of having killed famous people. And he could have also resisted getting involved because he'd be too nervous. You know, a curse on both their houses. I don't want to get involved over here because who knows what's going to happen to me. And the Torah is teaching you none of this was a consideration for Pinchas. He didn't care who they were. He didn't care they are prominent. He's putting his own life in danger. Therefore, as an afterthought, as an afterthought, Pinchas, the Torah mentions them. This was not part of his consideration. He saw a man. He saw a woman. I don't care who they are. And therefore, Pinchas does what he does. Now, let's take this. Stay with us, guys. We're going to take this a little deeper now. What was going through, you know, this Shlumiel ben Suri Shaddai, this uh, Zimri, who's the prince, the head of a tribe, you know, he's not an ordinary Jew. He's not, he's not, some, he's not some guy in a tavern. You know, he's not some guy in a club who sees a girl. You know, this isn't, this isn't, what do you call it? This is, a, you're talking about a guy who's on a, you're talking about a high-level person over here. What in the world was going through his mind when he did this? Number one. Number two, why do we care that she's a Midianite princess? So one of the commentaries takes us at a very deep level. He says like this, there are always these people who, you know, we, what's it called, the brotherhood of man? Uh, what, what's it called? Uh, all, all streams of religion are, what's it called in Judaism? Um, when they talk about all streams, they're very, the streams of religion, they were all the same. You don't know what I'm thinking of? You don't um, uh, it may be denominational. That sounds good. I don't know what it means. It sounds good. But the, uh, <laughs> there's an idea that, that, you know, we're all, it's all one family. Mankind is all one family, which doesn't work, by the way. It does our mankind is not one family. Mankind, that's never worked, didn't work in the United States, and it's never worked, and it never will work because mankind are created different. But let's all be united under one. There's a word. Come on, guys. There's a word. There's a word for religion. We're all co-religionists or whatever. Uh, what? Well, not Baha'i. No, uh, Baha'i is a certain, what do you call it? No, there's a whole idea of that. Whatever it is. Never, what? Is that what it is? No, no, that's no. a different thing. Uh, no, pantheism, no. Okay, that, humanist. 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 Okay, that sounds good. Humanist. Well, we all call it humanist. So whatever it is, Shlumiel, wait, this Zimri, we're told is, his the real name is Shlumiel, not Shlumiel, Shlumiel ben Sarishadai. Now, the word Shlumiel comes from, the word Shlumiel comes from Shlemus, completion. He, he's got a goal. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a pacifist. We're going to, what do you call it, we're going to reach out and we're going to make the entire world, we'll all be one happy family. And how am I going to do that? I'm going to marry a Midianite princess. But of course, I'm not just going to take a Midianite princess, I have to convert her. I can't just take a, take a non-Jewish rock, I'm going to convert her. Now, there's only a pro, one problem here. Do you know that at the time of, 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 of David HaMelech and Shlomo HaMelech, the Jewish people didn't accept converts? Why not? Times are good. Yeah, of course. Hey, everybody wants to join. Everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon and join the winning team. I've been accused of being a Manchester United fan, a, a City supporter, and being a fair weather fan, where there is absolutely no grounds for that whatsoever. I just happen to get lucky. The uh, uh, what do you call? It? I remember in Israel in the '90s seeing some Israeli kid with a Chicago Bulls jersey. I get that thing off, man. What do you? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's a Chicago Bulls fan. You know, I happen to be a big Denver Nuggets fan, but that's that's not the issue right now. Hey, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this guy is. All of a sudden, he's a Chicago. Where, where were you in the '70s when I was growing up? You turned the newspaper upside down. The Bulls were in first place. Where? Well, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he's a Chicago Bulls fan. You know, sure, you're sure you're, you're you're jumping on the bandwagon. So they didn't accept converts in the time of David Amalek and Shlomo because the Jews are at the pinnacle of their success. So you got a problem over here. They didn't get, the Jews here aren't the pinnacle of their success as well. Except that the Shlomo HaMelech did convert the daughter of Paro. Why? Because she's already a princess. She doesn't need the Jewish people for the, sake of their, for the sake of their prosperity. She's got plenty of prosperity. So the Torah emphasizes that Shlumiel had a plan here. His plan was to unite everybody. By the way, this is what he says the plan is. Underlying it all, 
underlying it all, underneath it all, is really what? A simple, simple sinning. Right. But this is his, this is his, what's it called, his rationalization. We'll unite everybody, we'll make one giant big happy family over here, and don't tell me I can't convert her, because anyway, she's a princess. So she could join us, she's, she does, she's obviously, her motivation is perfect as well. And yet, what's his name? The Torah tells you his name is Zimri. Zimri, the word lizamer, liz, means to, if you ever, where they, to prune, to prune trees. You know what you do when you prune trees? You cut off branches. That's how you prune trees. They cut off the branches in order to help the tree grow better. His name is Zimri. He's cut off from the Jewish people. He's cut off from, from the world to come. And her name is Kuzbi. Kuzov means a lie. The whole thing is a falsehood. The whole thing is, that means you got wonderful, you know, you, you got the best motivation, the most, the most altruistic motivation you could come up with, and you talk a good talk, well, it tells a good story over here. The bottom line is that Pinchas sees right through it, and that the conversion is not a conversion, and that what his motivation is the wrong motivation, and he's causing the Jewish people to sense so he picks up a spear and he kills them, number one. Number two, I mentioned to you yesterday that there were six miracles here. There were six miracles that were done for Pinchas. Now listen carefully. The first of the miracles that it says, when it lists the six miracles, five out of the six were in Pinch to save Pinchas' life. When Pinchas needed it, otherwise he would have gotten in trouble. The first miracle that's listed is that Zimri didn't stop what he was doing as soon as he sensed Pinchas was coming. Had Zimri stopped what he was doing, so then Pinchas wouldn't be allowed to kill him. And it's listed as one of the six miracles. Zimri kept on going. He didn't stop what he was doing. I mean, okay, let's say he would have stopped. Let's say he would have stopped what he was doing. Okay, so Pinchas would have turned around. You know, he said, okay, my bad. He would have walked out. And that's it, game over. Nothing, nothing would have happened. No, he, no killing, no what? He called no drama. Why is that listed as one of the miracles? Why is that Pinchas, that Zimri continued and didn't stop? Why is that one of the miracles? I want to kind of play, says something phenomenal here. Remember I told you the Medrash says, how did Pinchas get in there? How did he get into the tent to begin with? He had the tribe of Shimon surrounding the tent, the leaders in there, the leaders in there doing Averis and, and sinning. And how did Pinchas get in? Pinchas comes walking in and he says to them, hey, you know, what makes you guys, what makes you think we're holier than you? Now, we're all so interested. So they said, ooh, the Fermis, are, the Fermis are getting involved too. So they all got out of the way. They let Pinchas into the tent. Now what would have happened if Zimri would have stopped? So Pinchas would have just walked out. Then what would the people say? <laughs> Pinchas. <laughs> no, 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 you don't understand. I didn't, I didn't do nothing. I, I would, <laughs> right. right. In other words, Pinchas' reputation would have been shot. So the miracle that takes place is that Zimri doesn't stop, which gives Pinchas the opportunity to kill him. Otherwise, he's, he's mud. Otherwise, he's worse than a guy who's given Shmuel Shmutz on the Internet. I can you imagine Pinchas comes walking out the next day. It's all over, all over the internet. Pinchas was in the tent with that, you know, but I didn't do anything. Yeah, but everybody in the world thinks you did. So Pinchas, the miracle that's done is a miracle that's in Pinchas' benefit. Otherwise, he would have what he called. Now, one last question. In, uh, this woman is a not Jewish woman. It's forbidden for a Jewish man to be involved with a Jewish, non Jewish woman. Why does she deserve to die? Why should she die? Because she made him sin. Oh, she made him sin. And therefore what? And therefore? Every non-Jewish man partakes, that... She partakes in the punishment. She partakes in the punishment, but she, 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 it doesn't, but for her it's not prohibited. For her it's not prohibited. What, what is it her fault? What is it her fault? Now there are two approaches here by the company. One is because they entice the men to idol worship. The idol worshiping is their fault. Number two, you're 100% you're correct. Remember we spoke about bestiality? What happens to the animal in bestiality? When a person gets, they kill the, kill the animal as well. So the commentaries say, listen, she was an item of sin. And as an item of sin, she deserves to die. That's what it says. Otherwise, he should die. Pinchas should have just killed him and not her. The answer is that she's an item of sin. And therefore, as the item of sin, she also has to be, has to be removed. One last point. No pun intended. If uh, uh, it, what, what, if you take a look at the sixth, take a look at the, take a look at the sixth line, where it says v'shem ish Yisrael. Everybody see that the sixth line. Now pay attention carefully. It says v'shem ish Yisrael hamuke who was smitten. You see where that is? On page eight seventy six, eight seventy six, uh, sixth line from the top. 
V'shemi Yisrael Hamuka, the name of the Jewish man who was smitten. Asher Huka Es Hamidyanis. Es over here means with. Who was smitten with the Midianite? Zimri ben Solo, Nisibe Salvashim. Now you notice when it comes to him, it says the word smitten twice. He was smitten and smitten with the woman. And by her, it says, Vashem Aisha Hamuka, the woman who was smitten, Kosbi Basur, Rosh Beisavashim. Why by him does it say smitten twice? And by her, it says it only once. You, you see the problem. You see the problem. Santi, you see that? You see, by him it says, Hamuke, who was smitten, Asher Huka, who was smitten with the Midianite woman. And by her, it only says it once. Your name is? David. David, beautiful name, by the way. Oh, thank you. Top rank, top rank name. Yeah, I think in Jewish rankings, David is, I think that's the number one. Yeah. yeah. Why are you guys, you know, you guys are so cynical. You know, you guys, listen, sometimes I speak truth. Yeah, go ahead. both like, um, Oh, very close, very close, very close. The uh, there are two. That means there are two aspects. Two. Uh, where are you from? Um, I live in LA. I'm from Canada. Canada. Which part? Saskatchewan. Oh yeah, good old Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, by uh, yeah, by uh, yeah, by. Uh, oh yeah, right. Uh, oh yes, yeah, Saskatchewan. Got lots of, yeah, yeah. I used to know who the mayor of Saskatchewan. Oh well, yeah, my favorite Sask- Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. It's a province. I know that, of course. The province, who doesn't know the province of Saskatchewan? They made major contributions to the world. <laughs> well, what do you, like? you got ice in your freezer, don't you? You know, where do you think it comes? Straight from Saskatchewan. There you go. So, uh, all right, the province of Saskatchewan. So the, uh, the answer is like this. He's a Jewish man. As soon as he commits the Avera, he is smitten from the spiritual world. That's Hamuka. As soon as he does the Avera, Hamuka, he's smitten. She's not Jewish. She doesn't have that same, that same spiritual potential. He is, first of all, smitten from the spiritual world. Then he is physically Huka Esa Midyanis. He's smitten with the Midianite woman, and she, too, is physically smitten. So there are two levels. You got what you're saying. There is the spiritual level that he himself is destroyed on a spiritual level as soon as he does the Avera. Now, gentlemen, very important. You could always do tshuva. So don't anybody say, well, now, well you know, we're, we're, we're all I'm in trouble. I did this, that, and the other thing. But your past does not matter one iota. Your past is completely gone. To the contrary. To the contrary. You're, the, fact that you're, the fact that you're sitting here, the fact that you're sitting here means that the past has been turned into a mitzvah. And therefore, don't worry about the past. He who did not do tshuva, and that's one of the problems. That sometimes you know, in life you don't have a chance to do tshuva. Maybe he was planning, well, I'll do this one avera, and then I'll do tshuva. Can you imagine? He would, let's say he was planning, I'll do an Avera, and then I'll do Tshuva. Uh, there's only one, something interfered with his plans, right? Something went terribly wrong. And therefore, a person can't go and plan to do Tshuva. But a person who has do Tshuva, everything else, there's a big delete button out there, and it's wiped out completely. And in many cases, it turns into a merit for the person because it was a contributing factor in their turning their life around. So... It has nothing to do with us. Everybody does tshuva. Tshuva is accepted. It was created before the world was created, and therefore nobody has anything to worry about. See you tomorrow.